actually join. <coughs> and we will let folks start to trickle in. Oh no, cancel, cancel. Okay. For a minute there, my screen said end meeting for all. I'm like, no, don't do that. All right, wonderful. I see we have people joining us. We will truly get started in just a moment. All right, go ahead and get started. I don't wanna waste any of our time um, from hearing from our wonderful presenter today. Um, so today we'll be hearing from Dr. Sadiq Shrestha. His talk is HPV related cancer in Nepal, head and neck cancer pilot study. This is part of our global health webinar series in the Sparkman Center for Global Health, UAB. Couple logistics things before we get into the webinar. Since it is a webinar, we request that you submit your questions using the Q&A button down below and feel free to submit questions that you have at any point during the seminar and they'll be there waiting for us when we get to the end. There also should be an option for you to turn on closed captioning if you were in the most recent version of Zoom. Um, and so look for that if that's something helpful to you. Without further ado, today we'll be hearing from Dr. Sudeep Shrestha. He is a professor in the Department of Epidemiology in the School of Public Health at UAB. He is also director of the Molecular Epidemiology Core Laboratory, director of the Program in Epidemiology of Inflammation, Infection, and Immunity, and director of the Nepal Health Initiative at UAB. He's a Sparkman scholar and has worked with us closely for years mentoring students. And we'll be talking today about his 2019 um, pilot grant award, uh, award. And we very much look forward to hearing from him. So welcome, Dr. Shrestha. Thank you for having me. Let me up my slide if I can find it. Where did it go? It's always the fun part of Zoom. Yeah. Where on all the screens? Okay, there it is. I can everybody see that? Yes, yes, we see your slides. <clears throat> All right, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to come and you know talk about some of the work that we've been doing in Nepal. Um, the title that was given is is not exactly you know what I'm going to be talking about because you know the the Sparkman Center funded. Um, study is more of a feasibility program that we are trying to develop. But before we get there, I'll, I'll navigate through, you know, some of the work that we have been doing in Nepal um, and how we came to this head and neck cancer pilot study. Okay. Um, in terms of disclosure, you know, this Hologic that sponsor, sponsored some cell sampling kit uh, and genotyping in one of the projects. So for some of you who are not familiar of um, where Nepal is, you know, Nepal is in Southeast Asia. It's sandwiched uh, between India um, and China and Tibet. Um, so that's where it is. Um, it's about the size of um, Georgia. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, one interesting thing about Nepal is we don't have that rectangular, you know, flag. Um, like most countries do, uh, it's a two of these triangular. So you can easily distinguish uh, the flag of Nepal, okay? Um, the capital is uh, Kathmandu. Like I said, um, it's about a size of uh, Georgia. 
you know, just think of it, you know, Georgia has about, I think, 10 million people. Uh, Nepal has close to 30 million people. Um, and, and that's a big, you know, condensed area. About ha half the population is um, women. Um, life expectancy at birth, you know, surprisingly is at seven, 71 years now, um, which has been a big dramatic leap in the past, you know, several um, decades. It, it always is a little bit deceiving that Nepal is a small country, but, you know, with 30 million people still there are, you know, 102 um, ethnic groups. And if you look at, you know, the poverty level defined by um, a US $1.90 per day, still about 10% of the people in Nepal live under poverty. Okay, so like Katie mentioned, you know, we have this UAB Nepal Health Initiative, you know, that we have started here at UAB. There are several faculty members here <clears throat> um, involved directly or indirectly. Uh, Dr. Jivan Prasai, uh, Dr. Smith Giri, um, two of the al alumni, Madhav Bhatta, who used to um, work at um, Sparkman Center, but is at Kent State University right now. And then, of course, there's Derek Johnson, um, one of my first doctoral students um, who spent 15 months in Nepal <clears throat> and did his uh, dissertation. Um, currently, he's working for Doctors Without Borders. Um, and he's, you know, all over the world, but he, we are still in touch. Uh, we've tried to develop this. The person in the middle is the mysterious person. You know, if anybody wants to guess who that person is, I'll, I'll, I'll reveal it later, but you can put his name if you think you know who that person is um, on the chat box. So talking about Sparkman Center, you know, I've had a long relationship with Sparkman Center. You know, I, I joined UAB in 2005. You know, back then, you know, during the summer sessions, uh, Sparkman used to have um, International Public Health Summer Institute where they would bring, you know, scholars, you know, from all over the world, about 30 to 40 and, and give them a crash course or training uh, for about three to four um, weeks. And we've had several people, you know, who come from Nepal that we invited, you know, as you see here, you know, from different institutes. Okay. So like I said here, you know, the two that I will talk about is 2008 and 2009, when we brought two individuals from Kathmandu University. So I was invited to Kathmandu University to give a talk and, and meet with faculty. So I was trying to impose a culture of research um, and, and talk about uh, what research is and so forth. Um, it, to my surprise, a lot of faculty were not aware of, you know, some of the research that they could do or how to collaborate and so forth. So the, the Dean now um, and the department here of the global health there kind of told me and asked me, hey, do you think you can um, write an article in their uh, journal. And I said, yeah, of course I will. And I, I wrote the challenges and opportunities of public health research in Nepal. And I'll go one by one. And, and this is what motivated me to some of the research that we are doing right now. So we always have to talk about ethics and protection because when we are look, talking about global health, we talk a lot about HIPAA and whatnot in the United States. But when we talk about you know, developing countries or low income um, countries, we sometimes forget about this thing because there is that ethics and protection of their rights um, and their data. The financial resources, yeah, we always need funding, you know, and, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Infrastructure, you have to have an infrastructure. You can't just <clears throat> go, you know, it's not like going across the street at School of Medicine at one of the clinics and trying to get data from there, you know, because everything is computerized and you can get that. But, you know, developing that infrastructure is a big thing um, in, in developing countries. And I call this localization because, you know, as we all witness, you know, you know globally, if you try to bring an idea, you know, from one country or one setting to the other, it's always going to be a problem. So I call it localization in the sense that 
you know, you have this global view, but it needs to be localized. It needs to be tailored to the settings, local settings. Knowledge translation, there has to be, you can't just go there and do some research there. It has to be translated to the local people. The opportunities to grow, you know, the local institutes, local, you know, students, local faculty, local people have need to have an opportunity to grow. We cannot just make it like uh, um, a, a, a exotic, you know, uh, travel just to go to some setting in globally and then try to pretend to do work. You know, it has to grow within, it has to be developed within that. And of course, academics, you know, everything should be, you know, there should be a report, whether it's a manuscript form or whether it is a report for uh, whatever, it, there has to be some accountability. Uh, and academics is totally different kind of accountability, meaning, you know, we need to, you know, share our ideas. Um, to a larger global people. And sustainability, you know, you can't just take a two years, you know, funding, go there, do a study and then close out everything. There has to be a trend, transition, you know, and, and the locals have to be sustained. So these were the concepts that I kind of, you know, articulated at that time. As some of you know, you know, I, I have kind of two lives. One is where I am I'm, I'm trained uh, genetic epidemiologist. So most of my work is working with genetics, trying to understand the biological mechanism um, or trying to develop biomarkers. But then, you know, when I was working with cervical cancer, it occurred to me that, oh, you know what, I, I need to start doing this population-based screening too. I need to start doing the other kind of work. And and there, there we are looking at the virus, you know. So in terms of cervical cancer, so that motivated me to do some of the work in cervical cancer um, in Nepal, okay? So one of the things that when we tried to do it was we tried to involve the government. So we had a meeting with the government folks and the government said, well, we, there is no uh, very little data. I won't say no, there were a few studies at that time, um, very little data about you know, SPV um, prevalence uh, in Nepal. But they said, we need you to do, if you're gonna do it here, you need to do it strategically. You know, at that time, Nepal had you know, five distinct, what they call development regions. I don't know if you can see it, but you know, there are these red marks that kind of you know, cut these development regions. Now they're, they're, you know, um, there's totally different, there's seven provinces, you know, and it's totally different. So at that time, this is what we were told, said you can do the study, but you know you need to do it in five and tell us what the prevalence of SPV is and what you find in those. So like, okay, let's do it. So the first site, and, and I've kind of circulated these four sites and I'll tell you why there aren't five, okay? So the first site we said, well, let's do it in Kathmandu because this was the first time that we are trying to do this. And we, you know, we identified a place where, you know, it was a, a little bit homogeneous population, where in the sense that, you know, we're looking at women who are, you know, farmers, you know, who farmed and it was just outside of Kathmandu. So it was a little bit easier for us to uh, do the study. We were gonna do, you know, pelvic examinations. Um, we were trying to do VIA at that time, uh, but we didn't quite do that. And then we were also trying to take their samples and then um, do some SPV and STI testing. But what happened, and like I said earlier, where I disclosed, you know, Hologic was going to, you know, donate some of those self-sampling kits, and um, so where we could collect some of these samples. But little did we know that, you know, their kit um, contained uh, methanol, and so because of that Nepal did not have an agreement in terms of air transportation to bring methanol in these kits. So because of that, when we had we had already announced that we were going to have this health camp, um, but we did not have the kits. So we had to go without the kits, but we still did the health camp. So as you see here, you know the main thing that we found was well about twenty eight percent of these women who came to this health camp you know, had abnormal pelvic, you know, examination based on, you know, the subjective, 
you know, pelvic examination that our clinicians did. And the other thing was a lot of women, of course, were not educated. And, and this will come over and over again as I go through. The next site that we did was in the far west. You know, I'm, I'm going a little bit faster than I need to uh, because I want to get into the head and neck cancer. But if anybody has questions, just put it there and Katie will remind me that there's a question. The next site that we did was, you know, okay, we did it in a homogeneous population. How about if we do it in a slightly different population? So in West Nepal, a lot of males go outside the country you know, as migrant workers. A lot of them go to India and, and a good amount of individuals also go to Middle East. And so we said, well, let's, let's do this, you know, do a testing on these women. So that's, that was the target of this. And this is also the, you know, one of the aims that Derek did for his dissertation. So as you see here, you know, you know, it, it was very difficult, you know, the, to travel from the nearest airport to this site, you know, the distance was about from here to Atlanta, but it took us, you know, I, I went there too, it took us 13 hours to get, because you can see those, you know, hilly, you know, muddy, um, invisible roads that we had to take. So when we did this, we had the kits at this time, we had resolved the way to get the kits, you know, so we had this you know, thing. So we said, look, nobody's done this self sampling thing in Nepal. So let's do and see what happens. So for the same woman, we took two samples. We had them do the self collection of their own samples. And then we had the clinician take the samples. And down there you can see, you know, Pema, which I will remind you later on because she's the main person that I collaborate with. She was teaching, you know, how to do the self sampling. And the one in the middle, you know, that is where, you know, um, that was the heart of the, the city, the way we did that. Um, so you can see that, call it downtown, if you will. So one of the main things of this finding was, look, you know, the kappa for some of you who take epidemiology, kappa of 0.62 is pretty good, you know. So with self-sampling, you know, which women in these areas specifically prefer over the clinician trying to, you know, get the samples. So that showed us that, hey, look, we can implement this self-sampling in the Nepali setting as well. Then we went from the migrants to refugees. So in East Nepal, in the area called Zapa, there are a lot of, you know, Bhutanese, uh, I misspelled uh, Bhutanese there, um, Bhutanese refugees uh, who come to Nepal. Because long time back, you know, a lot of Nepalese migrated to Bhutan, but they didn't have any paperwork for, for generations, you know, these Nepalese were staying in uh, Bhutan. But, you know, they had a campaign in Bhutan and all those people without any paperwork were asked to leave. And so a lot of Bhutanese didn't know where to go. You will also see a lot of Bhutanese refugees here in the United States. But at that time, a lot of them came to Nepal, but then they were again, you know, refugees. So they had to be within the camp. So we thought, why don't we do it among the uh, Bhutanese refugees? But later what we found was, you know, refugees are under the auspice of United Nations. So you cannot go and just, you know, go into their camps and do the study. That's the first thing. The second thing is you cannot ask them whether somebody is a refugee. Okay, you cannot ask them, you're not allowed to ask that. But there are ways to do it. So we use that algorithm, something like, how long have you been here? Where were you born? You know, did you migrate? You know, and, and those kind of, that algorithm kind of captured whether they were, you know, refugees or, you know, Nepal. Because they do speak Nepali as well and they look like you know, they are Nepalese. So what we found there was also, there was no real difference um, between, in terms of the prevalence. I mean, the SPV was still prevalent in both populations, but there was no big difference in those. So it's about, you know, nine to 11%, you know, individuals were uh, positive for SPV when we did that. Okay. And then as we were doing this study, you know, you know I got an email um, from somebody that I know at London School of Hygiene and said, hey, so the, you know, somebody, you know, um, approached us and they want to do 
HPV testing at Lukla, which is the Everest base camp. And I gave your name, is that okay? I'm like, sure, why not? We'll do it. So this is Lukla. I, I, unfortunately, I was not able to go there during this um, a study. And here too, you know, so remember in the first two studies, when we did it, you know, we brought samples to United States to test it. So you might imagine how tedious it was. We had the, you know, samples collected and then we had to ship it here. We had to do all these documents, documentation to bring the samples to United States and then test it and then give the results, right? So in this Everest Base Camp study, what we, we were slowly progressing. So at this time we said, hey, wait a minute, you know, let's start doing this testing in-house in Nepal. So we had uh, made an arrangement with one of the companies to you know, bring that machine. We were gonna pay for it. <clears throat> and these machines were smaller. So you know, the, the, even the porters were able to carry it you know, to different sites and we had generators to run the machine. Uh, this is mostly for you know, SPV testing. <clears throat> but little did we know that there was another obstacle. So we were on the, a few days before that we were supposed to get this machine you know, they told us, well, there is a problem. There is a problem because there, is a, there was a treaty between India and Nepal because we have an open border, but there's a treaty that any machine that is made in the third world, uh, third country cannot come through India. So which means the machine that we are gonna you know, use was made in Germany and it was housed in India at one of the clinics. So they were gonna let us borrow it for this study. But what happened was because it was missed in Germany, you cannot bring that machine from there. So we were hustling and bustling, trying to see if there are any other places that we could, whether Singapore or Hong Kong or wherever we could, and they were not able to give us the machine. And, but they gave us, you know, the cell sampling kits. That is why you see a discrepancy there, you know, because we had a total of about 500 people during this camp. Um, and 21 of them were VIA positive. But then in terms of the SVP testing, we only had 280 because it was, the camp was for three days. I think we got the, the uh, cell sampling kit on the second day. So everybody who was there for the first day, we could not do the uh, SVP testing because we didn't have the kit to collect the samples, okay? So you will see here, I don't know if you see my a little cursor here, that's Patricia Wizard. You know, she's the director of the Lukla Hospital, you know, there at base camp. And she's the one, a main person that we collaborated. All these individuals were the staff and helpers that, you know, helped us conduct the study. The other thing that I want you to see is on the left side, you know, over here, you know, you will see a, a, a red roof, right? But on the right side, the same building has a blue roof. The, the reason was, this was around the time of this big earthquake that was occurring in Nepal. So during the earthquake, the entire hospital was demolished, okay? But then, you know, the Lukla hospital, which is um, backed by a Swiss foundation, decided that they were gonna make the same, you know, type of hospital, but then make it a blue roof. So that is why you see a red roof and a blue roof. Okay. The other thing is, you know, Somia Khanna, who's a Spartman fellow, you know, will be working on this project. I'm not going to go in detail about this study, uh, just because it's the manuscript is in preparation, but I'm happy to have Somia work on this project. So during this whole process, we were also kind of assessing, you know, what is the type of knowledge that people have about SVV and cervical cancer? So the, the two papers at the bottom were from the different camps that we did. But the one on top, you know, with, you know, Shefa, you know, another student from UAB who went to Nepal, you know, uh, one summer, did this study and we conducted this study and surveyed, you know, medical students, professionals, nurse students, professionals, and asked them about what their knowledge was about SPV. And we were very, very deeply concerned about what we found. Uh, because it's one thing to find people, women in remote areas not to have knowledge, but to have these medical students, professionals, and specifically nurse students and professionals 
not sure about you know, SPV was a big concern. So I'm not gonna go in detail, but if you look at the one at the bottom, you know, we asked them if, if SPV can cause cancer. You know, a lot of people didn't say it was only in men, you know, I lost one professional. I mean, isn't that a concern that one professional said that SPV can cause cancer only in males? The other one was, you know, women only. You know, a lot of people thought it was only a women's disease. You know, not necessarily that it impacted males. So that made us think a little bit. So some of the lessons learned here was that, you know, camps can help, but it won't, you know, provide a continuum of screen and treat. Okay, I'm talking about cervical cancer. There's a lack of knowledge of SVB, you know, whether you talk about women or professionals. We need, remember I was talking about sustainability. It has to be sustained. There's no point of bringing samples across, you know, the oceans to do this lab testing. What about other cancers? And we need to have in-house academics. So at one of these <clears throat> camps, you see all this. Of course, this was before COVID, so nobody's wearing masks at that time. One of the things that came across to me was this gentleman, you see that, you know, with the umbrella. He came to me and he said, I walked one hour. And how come you're not testing me? You're only testing women. You're, and he said, you're acting like <clears throat> there's only disease for women. You know, how about the men? So that also kind of, gave us some idea and said, hey, maybe we should expand it, you know, this, this program, okay? So with that mind, you know, you know, at one of the, my visits, you know, I went to Nepal Cancer Hospital and Research Center. Actually, at that time, we were trying to see if we can build some more on cervical cancer because that's what we were working on. And you see here, you know, the one here, I don't know if you guys can see the arrow, but the one in the middle, his name is Sudip Shrestha. Okay, I'm not related and he's Sudip, I'm Sudip. A lot of people get confused with that. He's the chairman of this cancer hospital. This hospital is affiliated with Rajiv Gandhi Hospital, which is a big cancer hospital in India. He was trained there, so he has that. The lady on the left, you know, is um, Anju. Um, I, Anju Shrestha. So she's also Shrestha, not related, but she's the OPGYN. I mean, she was the main contact person that we are trying to get. The one on the left side of um, Dr. Sudip, between me and um, Sadip and Sudip, is a medical epidemiologist. And he brought up and said, hey, why don't we do head and neck cancer? We see a lot of patients we see a lot of head and neck cancer patients. And my first question is, how many is a lot? And he was not able to give me how many because they did not have a registry or anything. He said, we see a lot. I'm like, what, is, what does a lot mean? So with that, our whole conversation changed from cervical cancer to um, head and neck cancer. And remember some of the motivations that gentlemen coming to talk to me and whatnot, you know, kind of led me and said, hey, maybe we should start some. So if you look at the global, you know, burden of um, SPV related cancer, of course, you know, warts, gentle warts are there and cervical cancer is there, okay? Um, then comes anal cancer and then comes oropharyngeal cancer. Remember head and neck cancer is there, but a lot of oropharyngeal cancer is attributed to SPV. So one of the things that we decided at that meeting was, hey, let's have a short-term goal, which is let's do a pilot study here at, at that particular hospital. And then the long-term was to connect all the other cancer hospitals. Keep in mind that you know, in Nepal, there are only in the whole entire country, there's only seven um, big and some um, small, altogether seven cancer hospitals or hospitals that, that, that can take care of cancer patients, okay? Here's the whole, you know, head and neck cancer. When you talk about head and neck cancer, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of organs there. It's a lot of anatomical. By no means, I am a, a clinician, so I won't be able to give you uh, details about uh, each of these organs. But at the same time, it is a concerning thing. It is a cancer 
that is, you know, well known, and it is, you know, a little bit more biased in in terms of its uh, occurrence in males. So, what about head and neck cancer in Nepal? You know, there is no registry, there is no data, but you know, a, a clinician that I talked to said there's about 7,000 to 8,000 new cases of head cancer. But the thing is, by the time they come and they are diagnosed, 80% of them have advanced uh, diagnosis, okay? And about 3,500 to 5,000 people die from head and neck cancer. One interesting thing that, you know, that I found, but I was not gonna present, you know, that paper uh, here was, you know, there is a paper that showed that, you know, in the south, south of Nepal, <clears throat> the mean is when they are diagnosed with head and neck cancer is about 40 to 50, somewhere between 40 to 50. And in the north and the, and the valleys, it's 60 to 65. So why this, you know, big disparity? Why this big difference between the two sides? Also keep in mind the challenge in Nepal is because like I said, there are only seven you know, cancer hospitals there. A lot of people go to India, you know, specifically Belor or Delhi, you know, because they have big cancer hospitals there uh, for treatment. So because of that, there is no way to track how many people actually have cancer, also including head and neck, okay? And the NHRC, which is you know, what governs the whole research in Nepal, you know, even the IRB, because every project in Nepal has to go through NHRC for IRB approval. It's even if you are in an academic setting, even if you are in Kathmandu University or whatever, you know, the whole protocol is gonna be reviewed by NHRC. So they're gonna, you know, develop a population-based registry for top 10 cancers, and that kind of includes head and neck cancer as well, you know, starting in 2018. Uh, but because of the COVID and whatnot, I, I have not um, seen the data yet. So if you go back to the original topic, uh, original title that I was given, if anybody asks you, what is the, what are the factors? Well, of course, chewing tobacco. Um, there are different types of tobacco that, is, that people chew, and especially in South uh, Nepal, which borders India. Smoking, alcohol. But the other things that you know are listed here, but the two things, of course, for my interest was infections. And because I do genetics, you know, there's a genetic factor as well. So that was what uh, you know I was thinking. So it kind of reminded me of that disparity, you know, about the 40, remember the south and, and the northern part. You know, I, I looked in the literature, and if you look at the HPV infection, there's a bimodal. This is just for, you know, um, head and neck, you know, samples that were tested, oropharyngeal um, cancer samples that were tested for HPV infection. In the males, it looks like it's a bimodal. You know, it's about around, you know, 30 years, you know, they see this high prevalence of HPV infection, and then around 55 or so. This is just for HPV infection, okay? But if you look at the head and neck cancer itself, it doesn't show that bimodal distribution. A lot of them are like what we saw in the North, 60 to 64 um, is, was the peak. That's what we saw. I mean, that was reported um, in Nepal as well. But why is it that the people in the South developed this cancer earlier? And I'm not going to go in detail of this because, as you saw, you know, there's multiple anatomical sites that's involved in head and neck cancer. So the symptoms might be totally different, and it's a little bit difficult to say whether it's cancer related or not. The key thing here is there is no screening method. There is no way to screen. You know, this it's not like cervical cancer where you can screen. And the prognosis is, you know, if they come earlier. You know, the, the five year survival rate is pretty high, right? With surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. But remember, I said that about 80% of these people come at later stage. And so the five year survival is late too. So that kind of also motivated us and say, hey, maybe we should develop something in terms of head and neck cancer. So, with that in mind, we wrote a proposal for this pilot study at 
you know, with the Sparkman Center. And I'll go through one by one with the specific aims that we have written at that time um, and where we are, okay? In the first one, we wanted to develop a, a hospital-based cohort, a clinical cohort in that, you know, Nepal Cancer Hospital and Research Center that we had discussed. We wanted to survey some demographic information and then try to find out as much information as we can, and then try to connect this new information with the hospital-based EMR. Of course, the EMR is not in its fullest strength in that hospital, but at least it was registering some information. But what we decided to do was, you know, kind of consult them and then see, you know, if there is a way to make a database of this EMR there as well. Okay, so with the EMR, I mean, this is something that, you know, I presented at that time, you know, and, and nothing new for people who do EMR. I said, look, we can, you know, include their behavior risk factors. Um, we can look at the comorbidities that they have. Of course, the demographics, every clinical, you know, and pathology, you know, tests and images can be integrated and the type of medication that these uh, people get. And of course, the one at the bottom was what was of interest to us. And that is the second specific aim that I will talk about. So it's a no brainer for individuals who do EMR, you know, here at um, UAB, there's, you know, the I2B2 and we've heard of REDCap, how to um, manage that data and whatnot. And I have a lot of students who work on that, you know, um, as a matter of fact, two, two of my doctoral students, one, tomorrow, Jerry Digo, and then on Friday, Amrita Mukherjee, both of them have been using EMR and they will be defending their PhD thesis. So we had knowledge about, you know, how to, you know, work with EMR. So we kind of, you know, try to talk to them, talk to the hospital and say, can we set up with whatever they have, can we set up some additional information? Of course, there were a lot of Zoom talks and whatnot. One of the requirements with, with, the, with the pilot study was, you know, involving students and, and, and developing um, their career as well. So on the left topmost, that's Sanjeev. Um, and Sanjeev is now, a, you know, he was a doctoral student in, he was in Department of Sociology. He's from Nepal. At the time he was using a, a national questionnaire data uh, from Nepal to do his thesis. So I just thought, well, we're developing questionnaires. He has access to all these, you know, national standardized questionnaire. He can help us with the questionnaire. And of course, Amrita, you know, on the, on the top right, you know, she's, she was doing her thesis on, you know, using the EMR data set. So we said, well, Amrita, why don't you help us with the EMR? Whatever you have learned, you can go. Actually, it was right before the COVID, I think in 2019, if I'm not mistaken, that was in January, Amrita was able to go to Nepal and then talk to some of our colleagues there and then, you know, help them a little bit and give them some aspect of knowledge about EMR. Sanjeev, unfortunately, was not able to go because he was trying to finish his thesis. You know, he's a faculty now in Arkansas State University, um, but, you know, when he was ready, you know, COVID was there and, you know, he was not able to travel. The person on the, on the middle left, you know, um, that's uh, Dr. Prabhat Thakur, and he's a well-known um, head and neck cancer oncologist. Um, he works at the Institute and he's our main collaborator there. So with that, we said, okay, let's start making the questions. And he, and for some of you who know it, you know, it needs to be tailored, you know, to, to the Nepali setting. So we came up with this, believe it or not, 16 pages, 188 questions on demographics, housing, tobacco, smoking, chewing habits, family history, oral hygiene, sexual health, mental health, diet. Um, diet was added later on because, you know, Dr. Prabhat Thakur was interested in that. So we said, okay, let's add that as well. So as you can see, I'm just giving you a glimpse of some of the questionnaires, but wait, you have to, you know, convert these questionnaires to Nepali. So of course it needs to be translated. So that takes 
tremendous amount of time because we have to make sure that the translation is right and there are rules, you know, as some of you know, you translate to Nepali and then have somebody else back translate it to English just to make sure that it is capturing the same thing, okay? So we came up with 188 questions. And <clears throat> I'm sure some of you use the red cap tool, you know, and I, that is what I was thinking of, but then somebody, you know, one of our informatics there said, hey, there is this thing called Copo Toolbox. I don't know if some of you have used it, but it, it serves the purpose of kind of red cap. So while the nurse is interviewing this individual at the hospital, because we are, remember we are asking this question is on the patients. And the th main thing that we give as an initiative was uh, incentive was, you know, we are gonna pay two days of their hospital stay if they answer these questions. Well, as she was typing it, it would pop up in the toolbox. So it was very synchronized. So it, that was, and we made sure that, you know, we had scrolled down. So we had our, um, because we have used this for cervical cancer. So it was a little bit easy to, you know, translate it. But then again, all those 188 questions with all these options were the drop down menu that we had to develop. Okay. And what we found out was, you know, some of the individu individuals were uncomfortable answering sexual behavior questions. And then we also realized that the diet questionnaire was too long, you know, because you're asking a lot of things. And so we have decided to drop the diet questionnaire for now. <clears throat> uh, but uh, in the meantime, we will try to see if we can revise the sexual behavior because I don't, they were not comfortable. The other thing that we realized was it was taking a lot of time. Imagine asking 188 questions to a cancer patient who's there. So we have to somehow find creative ways, you know, to do that. We also realized that the mean age was 51 and 54. Remember I was talking about 40s and the 60s and somehow it's right in between. So if we can develop this, you know, um, down the road. Now, keep in mind, we only have nine individuals with all full um, questionnaires up there. They have started uh, about, I think there's about 21 individuals that they have started, you know, um, asking these questions, but only nine of them have completed this so far. Okay, so it's a tool books, toolbox where, you know, I can log in here and as, as the, our nurse is interviewing and entering it, I can see it live, you know, so it's very password protected and whatnot. If anybody wants to use that, you know, let me know. The other one was bank biological specimen. Like I said, you know, th this there was not a, like a study study, but this was more about feasibility, you know, uh, of, of certain things that we could do with head and neck cancer. So in terms of that, we wanted to make sure that we have some bio specimen that was collected. Remember my background is in genetic um, epidemiology. So I was interested in saying, okay, why do we always have to send samples outside the country? Let's just store it in house and let's manage the samples. And that is what we have been starting to do. Uh, of course, with this very you know, small pilot you know, grant, we're only, we can only do so much. So we bought a, a freezer and we're gonna uh, put all these samples here for whatever number of patients. And once it gets full, then we'll think about alternate. We've already started applying for other grants to get you know, some storage space. And I circle in red just to make sure that you know there is a key, so it's always locked. So right now we're just you know collecting samples of whatever remnants that they have with the you know lab tests that they do. Remember they do blood tests, urine tests, and after that they throw it away. So we're just saying, hey, don't throw it away. Just give it to us. We we'll link it to the EMR of these patients. We have questionnaires and whatnot. Okay, and right now we can do that in toolbox as well. Um, as we were discussing, you know, one of the members in that original meeting um, group that I showed was a pathologist, and they said, this is a great idea, but the pathologists wanted to uh, save their own samples, you know, those blocks or biopsies that they get. And we are just trying to help them just to make sure. Remember, some of them are in FFPA, so it doesn't necessarily need to go in the freezer. 
So they can be in room temperature as well. So we will have this, you know, pathological samples attached to this as well. And the, the last thing was, okay, with all these biospecimen that we collect, you know, we wanted to see, you know, what was the occurrence of SPB. Remember, you know, most of the oropharyngeal cancer is related to SPB, not necessarily every anatomical site, you know, within the head and neck cancer. So we wanted to do that. So um, with that, we had purchased, not through the Sparkman grant, but you know, through another mechanism, we have purchased this um, uh, reader uh, from Atelier. You know, it's a company, Atelier. Uh, it's not US uh, FDA approved, but it has CE marks. So the Nepal government is gonna let us uh, use this. Uh, we do have funding to do uh, 1,500 tests, and we're going to include some of these head and neck cancer um, samples as well. So the good news is we have started um, through our initiative, you know, a lab uh, in Nepal to do uh, SPV testing for research. So now going back to the original thing that I was talking about, ethics and protection. We consent every patient, okay? Financial resources is a question because you know, that is related to sustainability as well, okay? Um, infrastructure, we are trying to develop this infrastructure. Glocalization, just an example, you know, we're trying to convert everything in, in Nepali, you know, just to make sure we have Nepali staff that are being trained. Knowledge translation, yes, as we are talking to these patients, we are also trying to teach them um, trying to, you know, when they are, after the questionnaires are filled, we're trying to tell them what to eat, what they should do, they not do. We have made some flip charts, you know, so we can um, give some knowledge back to them. Opportunities to grow, you know, we, we have, while we have students who are coming from here to uh, going from UAB to Nepal, we also have some of our staff. One of our staff recently, um, is going to, uh, is in actually, is in Netherlands and is about to finish his um, MPH in Netherlands. Another student is uh, going, another staff is going to Germany for masters as well. So academics, you know, we, we try to make sure that we are training. One of the things, if you may or have or have not um, recognized, all first authors um, in our publications have visited Nepal. You know, I'm, I'm one of those people who believe that you have to be there and understand that so that you have the flow of the whole study and understand it to write the paper. You cannot stay behind the computer and not knowing what it is out there just based on your data. And sustainability, I hope, I'm hoping that, you know, some of these things um, can be sustained. You know, we've been working with the NGO, of course, academics, hospital, and the government. So hope hoping that it will be. Just a reminder, you know, again, going back, if you are landing in Kathmandu, this is what it looks like, you know, on the top left picture, you will see it's, it's a Buddhist um, temple up, up in the hill. Um, last year, November 19th, which is only a few days away, you know, um, WHO had a movement and, um, and, and they wanted to light up you know, monuments um, because they wanted to do a 90-70-90 strategy because that's like 90% of the girls under 15 would be vaccinated, 70% of the women within that age group, uh, 30 to 60 would be screened, and 90% of those who had pre-cancer would be treated. If they do it by 2030, if they can attain that, they think that they can um, eradicate a we, not just they, we can eradicate cervical cancer. And to do that, actually, somebody from WHO, you know, approached me and said, hey, do you think you can do something in Nepal? And this is what we did. So you look at that hill, and that, that is how the glowing thing, the teal color, um, that is what, you know, the, they wanted. Um, they, this was done all over the world, and we were happy to be part of that. A lot of, lot of people to, you know, thank, and, um, a lot of small fundings that we had. The lady in the middle is Pema Lucky. You know, she's the, my main collaborator. She runs, she's the director of the NGO. 
And one of the things that we reminded everybody was, you know, even with NGO, you can do academics. You know, a lot of people want to go directly to universities and whatnot, but we can develop a culture there. On the right side, you know, there was one summer we had um, four students. So we had, this was through um, Dr. Polly, uh, Pauline Jolly's uh, MERT, you know, program that we sent three students. There was one student um, who came from Pittsburgh um, and the person in the middle, the other male besides me in the picture, is the one who is in Netherlands right now doing his master's. There are a lot of people that I've already shown the picture before um, um, that I, I did not put it here. And, but then a lot of people here like Joanna, you know, who's always helping me, Kate with IRBs, Karen, um, Dr. Tom Broker, Ravi Paluri was here. He was the main oncologist helping us, but he's in um, Wake Forest now. And um, there are several people from NFCC, um, Mingma, who's the main person, um, and all the staff. So with that, you know, I'll take question. Now, I don't know if I saw anything in the chat box about that gentleman. Uh, who I did not name. Did anybody take a guess? I don't think we've had anybody guess. Okay. So I guess I should reveal it. That's Dr. Howard Wiener. You know, Howard Wiener um, was in Peace Corp way, way back then. That is, you know, um, I think in the 90s, maybe. Um, so he was in Peace Corp in Nepal for two years. He's a senior statistician that you know, the, the, the statistical guru uh, in the School of Public Health. Um, he actually has a Nepali name. I think it's Suman Kumar, he calls himself. Uh, so he's also part of our Nepal Health Initiative. So with that, you know, I'll conclude. So hopefully, you know, you know, you get a sense of where we started and where we are and specifically in terms of the Sparkman um, uh, funding. And I want to thank everybody in Sparkman Center for being patient because, you know, during this COVID time, it was not difficult. Some of the things that we were trying to do with the head and neck cancer, it takes time. Of course, you know, during the COVID, you know, we could not do anything for almost a year. Um, and um, so we had to extend in and, and Thank you, Spartman, for being um, so patient with us. All right, with that, I will see if there are any questions. If not, I guess people can have their eight minutes back. <clears throat> Thank you so much for this presentation today, Dr. Shasha. It's really interesting to see the way that uh, your work evolved from this beginning with a focus on cervical cancer to addressing other needs um, like head and neck cancer. So I will remind folks, if you have a question, you can submit it in the Q&A. Um, we'll give folks a minute to do that in case they're thinking of something, but I was wondering if you could talk to what you see as your next steps, like how does this project continue moving forward? So one of the things <clears throat> that is very important is, you know, you, you have the tests, right? You, you do the, I'm talking about, let's say cervical cancer test, right? You have the test, but the, those tests are not like something like, it's not a litmus test, right? You know, you cannot give it, you know, real time. It takes a little bit time. And once the, 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 the problem in a country like Nepal and any other you know, developing countries is once the woman or even the male leaves the clinic, it's very difficult to get them back. You know, and um, I have a, we're submitting a grant, which is due actually tomorrow. Uh, and that's using mHealth. You know, we're trying to see, because one of the things that we realized was, I, I think it is true for a lot of countries. You know, as much as, you know, poverty is in, in Nepal and so forth, one thing that people actually have in remote areas is a phone. Uh, they have phone. And especially in the areas that we were working on where, you know, we're talking about migrant workers because their husbands are somewhere else and they're sending money and buying phones because they need to be in contact. 
And so through that mHealth, you know, that using the mobile phone, we're trying to see if we can get them back to the clinic, you know, to get their test results, make them understand. Also, we are trying to see if we can make some, you know, applications, gadgets where, you know, here in the United States, they have started using like a video game kind of thing where it is actually are playing a game, but it's actually, you know, you know, teaching you all these things. So we're trying to develop that as well. Now, in terms of the head and neck cancer, I think the main thing is we're trying to see if it is feasible, where, where at the words of saying it is feasible, but there are a lot of things, you know, because with the small funding, if we were able to do that much, I think if, if, but then the thing is we need to make sure that it's sustained. We have to, you know, convince the hospitals and academic settings that look, it, this is sustainable. Right, right, that makes sense. Let's see, well, ooh. okay. A couple of questions have come in. So Lisa Kimbo would like to know, uh, would you talk about your Nepalese collaborators? How much research oriented capacity building has come through this project for the local Nepalese team? So right now, you know, remember I talked about Derek Johnson, you know, mm -hmm. who was a doctoral student. He's still involved in the Nepali thing. And every now and then he um, runs this nowadays, you know, Zoominar, webinar kind of thing with some of our collaborators and talks about informatics, talks about analysis, you know, because he's the main person still doing some of the analysis, but he will help them with that. Um, in terms of our direct, you know, payment or trying to bring someone to, to UAB, we don't have the resources. Um, if there are opportunities, you know, in, within the UAP, I would love to bring and have them train. If there was something like that summer institute, you know, back then, that would be a great thing. Um, I know that, you know, UAB has started, I'm part of the, <clears throat> the thing, um, giving this grant writing workshop in Pakistan and Kenya. And I mentioned it to the Dean saying, hey, why not do one for Nepal too? you know, in down the, down the road. Um, the two individuals that I mentioned, the Dean and the chair at Kathmandu University, we talked about doing a workshop and we had talked about doing a workshop. So currently, yeah, we may not have it, but we are trying to give that, you know, we, we've included them in the manuscript um, and whatnot. And we kind of made them do simple things like two by two table, you know, so that is where we start. But in terms of the program itself, you know, I won't say we have it, but we are trying our best. It's interesting to me to see how global health will continue to respond to the shift to doing so many things virtually, because there is so much we can do, but then there's also a real benefit from being able to convene together in person. And so thinking about things like workshops, bringing someone here, taking someone there. It definitely takes a different level of resources, but you might have a different level of engagement as well. Yeah, interesting. Okay, uh, another question came in asking um, your perspectives on possible lessons learned from your project that could be ap applicable or transferable to the US or places in Alabama um, for things like people <coughs> doing access to healthcare, um, so if you talk about vaccine, mm -hmm. um, I think people in Nepal, you know, are used to vaccine all the time, right? I mean, they, they, this is not a new concept for them. So they are more welcoming than here in Alabama, unfortunately, mm -hmm. right? The problem there is, you know, they don't have vaccine, you know, and that is a totally different thing. There is no hesitancy, you know, but it is, um, the resource is not there for them in remote areas. And it is a little bit frustrating that when we, and we haven't done a lot of, you know, outreach programs here during the COVID time, you know, but it is frustrating that we cannot give vaccines to the people who actually want, you know, so that is one thing. The other thing that we learned was, you know, in one of our studies I did not mention, we did a pilot study you know, where whoever came to the health camp, we charged them five rupees. Five rupees is like maybe five cents, okay? 
And we said, if you come back to get your result, we'll give you your five rupees back. Okay, five rupees is not a lot, but just to get that five rupees, women actually came because sometimes what happens in these remote you know, areas is whenever they think it is free, they think some, they, they are suspicious. They're like, something is wrong with why is it free? But then if you can minimize the cost and make them accountable, make them a little bit own, own, have their ownership of their health, I think that works there. Um, I don't know how translatable that is in Alabama because I don't do you know, outreach work here in Alabama. So it's a little bit difficult for me to comment on that, but definitely for uh, vaccine, it's, it's a tale of two, two, two ends. You know, they don't have vaccine, they'll take it anytime. Here, they don't want to take it. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. That is sadly the truth for lots of, lots of places. Um, well, we are right at 11 and we've answered the questions that have come in. So we'll wrap up. Thank you again for your presentation. So interesting. I know I personally learned a lot and I'm sure everybody else listening did as well. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good one.